Um, well, this is just such, I mean, again, it's such an honor to be talking to you. Um, and we're just going to have a conversation um, about Reverend Martin Luther King. So if you tell us about the first time you met Dr. King. Well, I met him when I was a senior at Spelman College, and he came to speak in chapel. And chapel was compulsory. And I was a rebel about that, too, um, except that I remember more about chapel now. Um, than about all my classes. And the first thing I did when I began to chair the Spelman Board was reinstitute compulsory chapel. Um, but we had all the great speakers of our time. And um, um, this was in my senior year of 1960, 1959-60. Um, I'd been abroad for 15 months um, studying abroad. Spelman was really ahead of the term then. Um, and he came to speak in chapel. And I um, remember it as if it was yesterday. Um, and I quote him right now, and when I'm having a hard time, I think of what he says about never giving up. Um, but he talked about nonviolence, and he talked about love. Um, and, but more importantly, he talked about the importance of keep going forward and keep moving forward. Um, and he said, if you can't fly, you drive. If you can't drive, you, you um, run. If you can't run, you walk. If you can't walk, you crawl but keep moving forward. Um, and it rings in my head when you are dealing with all these folk in Washington who keep wanting to move us backwards, but we're never going to go backwards, never. Um, and we're going to build on the progress of the last almost 50 years, which has been progress, and ebbs and flows, go forward, go backwards. Um, but we've gone forward a lot, and we're going to finish this job of ending poverty in America, but starting with our children. Did you get that sense when you first saw him uh, speak that you um, that he understood the burden of this movement of like the what he was taking on that changing the world and the weight that might have been? Oh yes, um, he was always accessible, and I think that most of the times I saw him, he was depressed and didn't know what in the world he was going to do next. Um, but he was always accessible, and I think I went to meet him right after that, said I wanted to come see him. He said, come see me. Um, and, um, and he, um, I loved him because he was one of those adults who didn't feel he had to have all the answers, who could listen, who didn't feel ashamed to say, I don't know what the next step's going to be. Um, and I guess most of the, con many of the conversations I had was when he was struggling like we were struggling um, for the next steps. Um, he was not somebody who was chosen to lead, who chose to lead. I think he was chosen by Joanne Robinson and the people, the women and the ordinary people of Montgomery. He was new in the block, new kid on the block, didn't have a whole lot of baggage, um, and they needed a spokesperson. So Joanne Robinson picked this new minister, Dexter, thank God. Um, and the rest is history. But he was always humble, he was always accessible, he was always struggling, and that gave you confidence that you didn't know all the answers. Um, and I know we used to laugh a lot about how terrified we both were of police dogs um, and what it felt when he was in that car going down um, after one of his arrests um, at Rich's. Um, and the isolation. I will cross a block to get away from a police dog since I first met them in Greenwood, Mississippi. Um, but he, he, was, he was able to laugh, but to talk about fear, but to say you don't let it paralyze you. And that was always um, reinforcing, I think, for young people struggling to find solutions to life's um, questions. Um, can you talk about how your relationship with him changed, how it, how it evolved? Well, when you're 19 and you don't know, you say, I want to come see you after that wonderful talk, okay? And, um, and he um, said, certainly. Um, and again, the accessibility was always there. And I remember he had to bump me because um, um, President Cowan was coming, but he kept his word. He was always there to kind of talk one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and during that year, um, which is when the sit-ins began to um, bubble up, um, and my, my Greensboro happened, and obviously um, all of us in Atlanta were absolutely determined to follow. And we were set up our own committee for human rights and published an appeal for human rights and was meeting with our college presidents who, and the chief of police in Atlanta, who was, they were about more containment, but wanting to listen. And Dr. Mays was all of our um, North Star in many ways. Um, but during that period, when, again, they were more concerned about 
keeping the lid on, but they were accessible. We were talking about our college presidents, and they asked that we do this campaign for human rights. I'm a, a write a statement, and I must say I reread it. It stands up as well today as it stood up then. It was terrific, and I thought the students couldn't read. Thought that the communists had written this. I mean, students couldn't write anything so eloquent and thoughtful and strategic. Um, but in planning the the protests in Atlanta, um, and we started testing our nettles before the sit-ins actually occurred. Howard Zinn was our chairman of history, and we used to have an annual ritual of sitting in the state legislature um, in the white section, and the whole place would drive into a halt, tell the, you know, the folk to remove these students. Um, and we tested the public library. We tested a little bit of everything. Um, but when Greensboro came, um, that was clearly the, the signal to say we can do this too. Um, and we met very, very quietly and planned it, and then met with our college presidents and laid out what we were about. Um, and I think it was one of the best sit-ins um, in, because we picked all public places. I went to City Hall. I led a delegation to City Hall. Um, but we took public places, bus stations, um, the court and state house. Um, but it was always the places where we knew we'd have the best legal chance. Um, and, um, and, you know, that was the first um, sound. And then the question is, what was next? And Ella Baker. Well, I'm sorry, don't let me. The, the focus here is so we're talking about Martin the Man, but also, and you're the, jumping forward to the later radical king post, uh, like starting with the march on, march against fear in the, in the Meredith march. So, could we jump ahead? Uh, Don't want to go quite there that quick because one of the things that we did was to plan a march across Atlanta when after this appeal and student stuff was bubbling up. Um, the Klan had said that if we and basically threatened us that if we kept making all this noise that they were going to put us in our place and so we obviously had to push back and we planned a march across town um, when he, they said that they would meet us and we were meeting with our college president and with Chief Jenkins, we had a great police chief um, and all said don't go and we decided we would go um, and um, I think one of the loneliest mornings I can remember was each of us from our respective students, um, co college campuses, going up to tell the kids what time we're going to meet and where. And our college presidents, after we'd had this thoughtful process, double-crossing us. And so the president of Spelman got up after I spoke, after told them we were going to meet, um, and said, um, I don't, you, don't, you shouldn't go. Um, and I don't know that I felt quite as lonely, except in Mississippi. Um, going out in front of the Atlanta University Library, um, and there was Lonnie King, and there was Julian Bond, there were Otis Moss Jr., and a few of us, and there was nobody else. And Dr. Manley got up after I spoke and told the Spelman girls not to go. Dr. Brawlett and Clark um, locked the dormitories um, so the kids couldn't get out. Um, this was after we'd had all these quiet negotiation sessions and so on. At any rate, we stood there and we stood there and we said, Lord, have mercy, what is going to happen here? But then we heard the Morris Brown students coming, singing from, they were the farthest away. And all of a sudden, and it was filled up, and we, um, King is in this, and we all began our march. The kids from Clark jumped out of the windows, and there was this big march. Chief Jenkins took his word, since we um, didn't take his advice, but he was there to protect us against the Klan who were there. And we got over to Wheat Street Baptist Church, which is where we were going, just to show that we could march wherever we wanted. And who was there? Our six college, seven college presidents were there to welcome their students, but more importantly, Dr. King flew up from Montgomery to welcome us, um, knowing that we had sort of gone against the grain. And it was just a wonderful reaffirmation. Um, and then we moved to when SNCC began to get formed in Ella Baker and sitting with him for those days at, at Shaw. But again, that was really, again, another thing of affirming the power of young people and the voice of young people, and we've never forgotten it. Wow. I did not know that story. That's amazing. Um, so if we talk about the, uh, the March Against Fear, can you talk about how, your, how that came about and the, you know, your, 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 just tell us that story? How are you defining the March Against Fear? That was James Meredith, and that's many years um, in advance, and one big thing occurred with my first plane ride and many of our first plane, we went to Shaw, and we formed SNCC. And Ella Baker was the midwife, 
and Dr. King was the host. And we spent two or three days, um, and Ella Baker was very important because she told us not to become a part of SELC. Um, but we spent three days with him, and again, he sat through all the meetings, he, he listened. I mean, he listened. Um, and we came away from that, my first plane ride, and we came away from that, um, having decided we started our own organization called SNCC. He was the midwife, but we did not want to become a part of SCLC. Um, and so that was the second big support system um, that he provided. Um, and between um, the time I finished Spellman, I mean, I would, he was, again, he was always there to meet if he wanted to talk and, and, and to listen. Um, and I went off to law school and I would see him when he came to different colleges. We'd sort of have the intergenerational um, programs, went to Wesleyan, went to different religious groups. But again, he was always, again, again, accessible. And that was really very important. I never lost touch with him during law school. Um, and um, then I went to Mississippi to practice law. And um, the Meredith March was a part of that. And at the time we went, it was still a hellhole. Um, the Mississippi Summer Project and had ended in 1964. Everybody had left um, for different reasons. The press left when the white kids left. Um, and, um, and Meredith didn't consult with anybody, still doesn't, um, bless his heart. Um, he's all gray and gorgeous now. I just took my grandchildren to meet him this summer, went on the civil rights tour. But at any rate, he did this march and he wasn't on anybody's agenda. He didn't consult with anybody. Um, and so um, Dr. King and civil rights leaders rallied around that and we all walked from almost from Memphis um, down to Jackson. Um, and that's when the first, and every night, again, accessibility, listening, um, we would stop and sleep in people's houses because the motels were not available. And Stokely and Willie Ricks and the Snake Kids, I was now kind of a, an, a former Snake Kid who was now <laughs> part of, just getting people out of jail, as part of establish. Anyway, I was a bridge. But we'd meet every night, and it was amazing to me how after long walks he would listen to them vent, listen to all of us vent, and it was wonderful to be a fly on the wall, with great patience, and I remember him often saying, Stoke, is it that bad, is it that bad, but he listened, and that was when Black Power first began to emerge, and I will never forget Dr. King's face um, when in Greenwood um, we had a rally, and Willie Ricks um, got up and started saying black power. He looked like the most stricken man. Um, but again, what I remember was the listening, the patience, trying hard to understand, because he really was committed to um, nonviolence, how to connect. And, and um, I don't know about how the patients do that, but he listened in Chicago. He listened whenever um, there was an outburst. The black power thing reinforced itself in, in, in Canton, where they you know, did gas canisters, canisters, and then in Jackson. Um, but that was the first real breach um, in the nonviolence commitment that many of us had grown to accept. Um, but he was not judgmental. He was always there um, to say, I don't go there, um, but I want to really understand why you go there. So patience, I mean, patience of Job, which I didn't have, um, and um, an ability to kind of just kind of be present. Were you torn yourself between the Stoke, the, your former Snake colleagues and the name change and King? Or did you feel you had to make a choice between these two camps? I didn't feel I had to make a choice. I mean, there's always going to be a continuum of views. And I had, I mean, I, I knew all of my Stick colleagues very well. Um, didn't agree with them on a lot. Um, the role of women in the movement was always complicated. And I wasn't somebody who was going to take a lot of guff off of any of them. Um, and, um, and it was... You know, and they were my friends, and friends disagree, husband and wives disagree, people in complicated situations disagree. Um, and when some things are moving very slowly, it is the job of young people to be more impatient and to push it. And I remember what it was like to be a young person and to push it. Um, and, um, but my job is to get them out of jail <laughs> and to try to keep them alive if I could, keep us all alive. Um, so no, um, I strategically disagreed. But I don't think I'll ever forget until I die the stricken look on Martin's face when they stood up in several places publicly saying that. And he would constantly try to understand me. Is it that bad? Are you, I mean, is it really that bad? 
but he stayed present. So going back to this, so the, the sort of the Black Power movement, what were the discussions like after the, at night between in the cabins and the talking, but it was Martin. They were heated. They were, I mean, um, the young people say what they got to say, okay? Um, and with the shooting of Meredith and with the aftermath of the 1964 summer project, um, and everybody left Mississippi, um, the repression was not, was not terrific. Um, you know, people were bitter about the slow pace of change, and the Vietnam War had had um, begun to encroach upon us, and people were preoccupied with other things. And I was left there not only as a lawyer with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cases to, 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 to handle, and everybody had gone, and the press had gone, um, but the issue was how were people going to eat, because that was the first thing that began to emerge after the, the folk left. Mississippi wanted black folk out. After the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party challenged in, in, challenged in, in Atlantic City, this is when we got out, so they tried to starve them out. Um, and they switched from poor for food commodities, which were not wonderful, but they were free, um, to um, food stamps, and they charged for food stamps. And many people had no income and could not afford food stamp. And so in the aftermath of um, the Summer Project of 64, Hunger became a very big problem, and secondly, the poverty program emerged in 1965, and the state turned down um, the Head Start program, and there was a provision built in a law, which I'd like to see built into every federal law that's designed to serve people, poor people, um, was that if the state didn't want to take the Head Start program, the community action program, that community groups could apply. Boy, we should have that in the Medicaid program with all these governors turning down tens of billions of dollars to give basic health care to their folk. And so community groups applied. Um, and King is in this story, too, because we ended up getting the largest Head Start program in the nation, the Child Development Group of Mississippi, CDGM, um, in 1964. That created the first, in 65, I'm sorry, and first jobs free of the plantation structure that had ever existed because they were pushing people off the land, wanted them to go north. Most people didn't have enough literacy or enough money to get on the bus um, or find a bus station or to pay for the ticket. Um, but it turned out to be a revolution in many ways. Folks saw that children could be excited. They saw that they could build schools. And it didn't matter how ugly they were with their kids. They saw books that reflected um, the images of their children. And it was a revolution, and the state cracked down. And Senator Stennis and Senator Eastland were, and Jamie Whitten were among the most powerful um, senators with, with seniority in Washington. And they immediately demanded they cut off this, this communist program, this, 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 this thing. <laughs> and, um, and we were determined, having seen the life that was there, um, that came from this program. Um, people say, I you can tell these CDF, um, the CDGM kids, they don't sit still. They always ask them all these questions. And parents began to understand how to help their kids and learn to read with their kids. And so they cut it off after a few months, after the first thing, and we had a knockdown, drag out refunding struggle with Sergeant Shriver and others. And in the middle of the toughest negotiations, um, I, we, it was in Atlanta um, at the regional office, and I called up Martin and said, you got to help, and he showed up. And I'll never forget Shriver's Sri face when Martin walked in um, to help us, and he said, well, I, I didn't know you were inviting outsiders. I mean, I mean come on. I mean, he was there, <laughs> um, along with his staff. And again, the, the, just the presence. And whenever you needed him, he would come. Um, and um, and that was that accessibility I try to remember, remind myself of when, when, when every 17-year-old wants to talk um, or when you've got something that really needs to get done. But I think that, um, you know, he was wounded, and, but it trying to understand and to listen to see where this bitterness had come from. Um, um, and they maintained the contact, and when he began to take a position against the war, and Stokely was in church and told him to come to Ebenezer one Sunday, he had something he thought he'd like to hear. Um, but never kind of let go of trying to sort of build a, a line of understanding. So from the, the uh, Georgia, the, from the Head Start program, uh, to, I'd like to talk to the, about the Poor People's Campaign, how, you, how that came about. You talked really eloquently about um, visiting uh, RFK and then bringing this message to King, and King being depressed until you give him this idea. Could you walk us through well, that? 
Wait, Mississippi wanted black folk to leave. They didn't want them to be there to vote. They didn't want to feed them. They were trying to starve them out. Um, they were trying to, you know, the, the violence continued. Um, the attacks on federal programs and moving to food stamps where people had no income and it was inconceivable to many people back then that there was no income. Um, and it was terrible in 65 and 66 and 67. Um, and hunger was epidemic. Um, and the, if you went out, as I did, try to go out every day or every week in, in the communities, you just saw the suffering. And um, you had to do something. And I, the poverty program and CDGM brought a lot of um, hearings and harassment about why the federal government was giving this group of church folk and civil rights folk, um, and that we were misspending the money. I was its general counsel. And one of the things that I feel very strongly about is that poor people have to have better management than non-poor people. Um, and some of the sick kids um, were not managing everything right, and I always want to say, don't screw up the program by not making sure that every, pro every dime is spent. But most of it was wonderful. And parents came alive, and children came alive, and the school people began to say, you can recognize these CDGM children, they just always ask them these questions, thank God. Um, and so that, that became an ongoing struggle, but meanwhile, the hunger increased. And um, we got called, I got called to Washington to testify about the child development program and about poverty and what was happening in Mississippi um, to Joe Clark's subcommittee. And we had Jacob Javits back then. We had Joe Clark. We had, where are they today? Um, and. Um, in the middle of it all, I asked them to come and see for themselves um, because they were the, 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 the repression and the misuse of the, of the dollars and the attacks on the Head Start program were all unjustified, and they agreed to come. And Bobby Kennedy came with them. Um, and I hadn't, I was supposed to talk about um, um, food and misuse of dollars, and they did politically use the Community Action Program, Mississippi misused everything. Um, but in the middle of it all, with I saw a wonderful picture recently with Lita Blackwell and Amzi Moore, who is somebody that ought to be put up on every billboard as a servant leader who was the wisest, smartest, he kept us all alive, he was where we all kind of lived in the Delta. Um, but in the middle of it all, when I was talking about Head Start, and as Dennis was there to testify, I said people were starving in the Delta and they should come see it. And to my absolute joy, they agreed to do it. And Amzi could tell you exactly where to go on one day's notice or half day's notice. And so that was um, the thing that really um, sealed me with, with Robert Kennedy, because I'd had an image about Kennedy's. Um, and, um, and that's when I first met my husband, because he sent him down to advance that hearing. Um, and I was really very busy, um, and I was expecting somebody like you know, Pierce Allinger with a cigar and Aragon and all the other, well, it was a <laughs> quite the opposite. But the bottom line is we went up in the Delta, and we, and Amzi found these children with bloated bellies and with, um, had had no food and poor parents, and, um, and watching Robert Kennedy outside of the cameras um, was one of the most moving experiences, and there's a famous incident of going in the back door of, of a baby um, with a mother in a dark room. I don't think they even had a wooden floor sitting there. And I watched him just poke to try to get any kind of reaction out of that child um, and couldn't. And, you know, it's just, and I, um, it changed my whole sense about who he was. And he came outside. He was somebody who touched a lot, which was surprising. I mean, when I would say hello, he would just kind of, you know, do a little pat. Um, and he, touched a child, there were some older children standing outside with lots of reporters who hadn't gone inside to look at Annie's child. And um, he asked the little boy what he'd had for breakfast, he had it yet, nothing yet. And asked him what he had for lunch, and it was nothing yet. Um, and um, you could just see how any adult and parent would respond to that. And the second thing that happened on that trip um, with the committee um, traveling out to see hungry families was in, Kenton, I think it was in Cleveland, Mississippi, but in one of the Delta counties, and a little boy, a little white boy, his dog ran out um, in front of the um, procession. Of, what, is, what do you say it when you've got a, um, 
all there. the cars out there screeching. I mean, they are the, what do you call them, the thing? But, but at any rate, our procession um, of cars and the child's um, dog ran out and got killed. And Robert Kennedy was f furious and stopped it, got out to talk to the boy and told them to cut off the sirens. Um, and so I became a groupie then. I'd had a very different image about who he was. And he went back um, after this trip and with Joe Clark, they went over to see Orville Freeman the next morning. So they got to get food down there, Orville, and they, became, they began to be pushes. And yet it was hard, even for Kennedy, and even with key people on committees and bipartisan people trying to do something. But at any rate, he stuck with it. Um, and in August, um, I had gone by to see him at Hickory Hill just on my way back to Jackson. And he was around his pool, and I told him how bad things were, and nothing was moving, and they were still charging for food stamps. Change is hard, folks, um, and you have to stick with it. And he said, um, I told him I was going to stop through Atlanta and see Martin, and he said, well, tell them to bring the poor to Washington. By this time, he was running, for, he decided he was running for president. And um, I went down to Atlanta from there before I went back to Jackson and went to SCLC. And... He was depressed. I mean, he was sitting in his office by himself. He was, I mean, all of us were he was struggling to see what, what do you do next. You had the Vietnam War. Um, the country's tension was moving away from civil rights and from the poor. Um, and I walked in, and he was by himself in the back of it, and I, I loved it. He always lived very modestly, and this was a very modest office. Um, and um, and he, was, he was depressed, and I told him what Robert Kennedy said. He ought to bring the poor to Washington, um, and he lit up. He just lit up, and he went home, and you can see what Coretta said about it. And he immediately um, began to sort of get the staff, who was not happy, I will just tell you that, um, and um, engaged, and uh, some people came over from Marks, Mississippi, just to talk to him. And he'd been in Marks. He'd been in Marks for a funeral um, and had gone to a, a center and saw children who um, were... The, the, the teacher had a one apple for lunch, and he, she'd carved up that apple for four kids. And that was the first time um, Ralph Abernathy said that he'd ever seen Martin cry in public, but he had to leave the school because he couldn't believe they were each getting a fourth of an apple, um, and the hunger in Marx was palpable. But at any rate, he responded immediately and called the staff together, who was not happy about this, and there was robust debate over the ensuing months about whether Vietnam should be the big issue or whether it should be economic opportunity and jobs. Um, and obviously it was by, obvious by then that the next step to talking about changing laws was to get people jobs. They had to eat, they had to survive, they had to work, they had to have an income. And um, so that was a very interesting follow-on set of months, but he stuck with it um, and committed himself to doing a poor people's campaign. And um, so... Talking about the, 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 I'd like to talk in depth about uh, Early House in September of 67 and the, the sort, of, sort of divide between, you're just talking about like Baez and you know, the sort of the non, the, the anti-war factions and, and you sort of seem to be leading the anti-poverty sections. Those kind of, what was the mood there and what were the discussions like? Well, it was, there were always robust discussions, <laughs> um, and I... So um, you can go back and like, tell, tell us a little bit about Early House. Well, Early House was a gathering of a retreat um, where I don't remember how many of us there were. I mean, whether it was 40, or 50. Um, Joan Baez was my roommate, but I never saw her. Um, and, um, but Andy and all of his people, and with some outside folk, um, and it was about where do we go next. Um, and I always loved it because he had very big tolerance for different views, um, and Bevel is not a, was not an easy man to not, <laughs> yeah, but, but, and I loved Jose Williams, I mean, they were, they, they all had very strong views, and Jesse preached, in fact, I remember Jesse really did preach, um, and, um, and Martin listened, but it was a very robust discussion about where one should go next, with a lot of resentment about this poor people's campaign. Um, and that Vietnam was the issue, and that black boys were dying over there, and that was draining all the money. On the other hand, you had all these hungry people right here in America with no jobs and no income. 
Um, and I don't think he wavered, and he waited for Andy always to find the bridge, um, Young, to find the bridge between all of these robust discussants um, who never were lacking for a word or a view. Um, and again, the patience of Job, as far as I'm concerned, I go, I'm, I'm having opposing views at some point. <laughs> so we, here, here's where we're going. Um, but um, he was amazing, but it was a very moving meeting. Um, a good meeting of open, <laughs> I'm not going to say debate, um, and, um, and Jesse, I can't, I can't, it's funny, I can't remember Jesse's sermon, but he sure did preach, um, and um, we moved away from there knowing we were going to be doing a poor people's campaign, not with a plan, not with a whatever, but that this is where he thought he should be next, but he also spoke on both because they were so interrelated, um, and um, again, the bridge row and the listener role and the trying to find the way forward. I'd read that in those sort of battles, like he said, I just want to go back to my little church at some point, like so the patience broke. Well, I'm, I'm sure his patience broke often, and I'm sure he did want to go back to the little church, and that was a whole lot of stuff he had to go through. I mean, it was a very tough life. Um, and we used to laugh a lot because I will go across the street before police dogs, right? And he, but then. That was it. He could always say when I was afraid. And, and going out to Georgia um, during the, the period when John Kennedy you know, made that right call, um, Daddy King. Um, but boy, we could laugh about police dogs. I will cross over two blocks um, because of the first time that they brought out police dogs in, in the South was in um, Greenwood, Mississippi in 1961. It was my first visit to Mississippi, and Bob Moses is the bravest man I've ever seen. He didn't move as the dog ripped his pants down. Um, but, but, but again, he could laugh, he could be, and he, and he, was, he didn't hide his depression or hide his uncertainty, um, but he would always struggle to try to find the way through. Um, and um, I really try to remember that a lot, because I'm not a patient person. And back to an early house, what, tell us about the mood of when they weren't talking about politics. What are they eating? What are the, are there any sort of non-political, like, is it? There's a lot of singing. They, we always sing. And when the music stopped, the movement stopped. Um, and music really was the glue that tied us together. It was the glue in all of our meeting. And I always remember Jose Williams um, in one of the worst incidents and in periods in Grenada, Mississippi. Um, and there were some feds down, my dear love, beloved Carl Holman and others, who'd come down to Mississippi because the place was exploding around school desegregation. And um, there were two mobs that night, um, and one was the police mob, or the cops mob, and the other was the white folks mob. And I just never remember, I chose the, to go with the, 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 the white folks, the bad folks mob, but not with the police, who were, I think, more dangerous. But, there are all these dances in the state. Um, but Jose jumped up on top of a car and started singing this little light of mine. And I said, and he could have been just mowed down on any, and, but that music was always the thing um, that would keep us going. Um, and when the movement stopped, the music stopped, the movement stopped. And whether you'd come in in the evenings and you'd debrief after they'd been shot off, talk to these old tell stories, well, I almost got shot off the plantation today, um, whatever. But we could sing, and singing and preaching were the glue, and I just can't say enough. Um, about the importance of music and, 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 and Miss Hamer's voice coming through um, in parchment or other people singing and, 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 and just being, you know, connected um, in this. Um, and when the music stopped, the movement stopped. Um, and so I am, um, um, but music and preaching, and I think if I can't tell you a lot of the particular debates about Vietnam versus poor people or where we should have jobs, whatever, but I remember just his sermon. I don't know what it was, but boy, we, it was good because <laughs> he showed and preached. And I remember singing a lot. Um, and I don't think we reached any formal conclusions out of that, but I just I left it knowing we were going to move ahead with the Poor People's Campaign in some ways. Um, and they were a very complicated crew to kind of keep all together. But um, I think that um, he, um, uncertainly, without clarity, without knowing where the money was going to come from, um, and with the country really not being very interested anymore. Um, you know, he was moving ahead. And I, again, the amazing to me is the tolerance he had for 
so many different points of views, um, and Andy was kind of the mediator. So, it brings us to the to the assassination and, and how terrible that was. Can you uh, tell us about where you were, how you heard about it, and how that you know changed? What that changed for you and. and it was, awful. it was awful, um, and at some level, I think um, it was inevitable. Um, I, I, it wasn't a surprise, but, but it was shocking. Um, it was awful. Um, and riots broke out, as you know, everywhere. And my first thought, including in the district, and my first thought was to go out and tell children not to loot and not to riot and get and ruin their lives. Um, and Robert Kennedy went to church that Sunday. Um, we went to Walter Point Royce Church, and then we went for a walk. And Marion Barry, my old stick friend, who was then wouldn't know what the hell he was doing here. Um, that was. And but I went out into the schools to try to help kids. For goodness sakes, don't 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 loot and don't. Um, ruin your future, and this little boy, about 12, looked me straight in the eye and said, lady, what future? I ain't got no future. I ain't got nothing to lose. Um, and I've been trying to answer that boy for the last 45 years. Um, and I think about him telling the essential truth in this um, incredibly rich, powerful nation that has not the decency to assure every child a future. But I was, we were devastated. I mean, we were ab it, was just, it was just absolutely devastating. Um, not surprising, but devastating. It was kind of inevitable. Um, and he was very depressed back then in many ways. It was, but he would keep going. I mean, he would keep going, but I think that um, he saw. Um, if you look at his last sermons, um, you could hear inevitability in his de of his death in his voice. Um, and. Um, but even so, when the inevitable happens, you're not prepared for it. And the, um, the um, funeral was the funeral, and the march was the march. And um, it was, but for the first thought for me is, you know, how do you get up tomorrow morning and, and keep it going? And that you honor him by what you do. Um, and, you know, it was, it, nobody had enough time to mourn. We were depressed, but you had to get up and sort of carry on that. And, um, and so that just refocused us on how you carry forward without your leader. I um, mean, with a very cantankerous, you know, depressed staff. But we did. And I'm glad we did, because I'm of the view that it has led to things that will continue to lead to things. And this country is going to end poverty, and we're going to end child poverty. Um, and there are millions of people who wouldn't be eating today, who have no income, um, who benefit. And if you look at the range of things that happened over the next 10 years, despite the perceived disarray of Resurrection City, change occurred. It doesn't occur overnight. Okay, you got to write and push and push and push and go back two steps and then move to three steps forward. But transformation and the safety net and nutrition, child nutrition, family nutrition, um, all those people sort of thank those people in that mud over to Resurrection City, you know, little step by little step. Can you talk about the Resurrection City and the, your idea for the Bonus Army, bringing that to King, and how, you know, sort of modeling the, 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 the march? I wasn't thinking about the Bonus Army a whole lot. We all looked at what had happened and people that had come forward, but we also knew that this was very different. It was different because it was really dealing with poor black folk and poor Latinos and Native Americans and poor Appalachian whites and others for the first time getting together. Um, they were convened in Atlanta at Pascals um, in January and all of them began to come together. And that was a big cross, that was a very big thing that happened um, of getting, um, finding common ground among um, the poor. Um, and that didn't make things easy. 
um, but it was again a, a, a big benchmark and it was also a very big translation of the next into the next stage of the civil rights movement which had to do with economic rights. Um, and doesn't do any good to be able to sit in a lunch counter, which is what everybody says commonly, if you don't have the capacity to buy a hamburger. But you need to be, be able to feed your children. Um, and you need to be able to educate them and get a job. And so, big important thing. It was the right thing to do. The war was still going on. Um, but half of Washington is really a result, and the public interest networks, is a result of that Poor People's Campaign. We have a massive, um, you know, nutrition lobby um, and lobby that, that relates to Head Start. And whenever somebody, you, you try to build a path and when it becomes a highway, you move on to the next thing to build a path. And so I just say that the, the, if you go and look what happened between 1968 um, and today, um, it's extraordinary. Not a whole lot of fanfare, a lot of change, it's grunt work. It's not just about marches. Um, it's about, you know, f policy and budget policy and whoever controls the budget controls the policy. And so I don't think the Poor People's Campaign was a failure. It was a stepping stone to the next phase of needed advocacy to deal with economic as well as political rights. Got to finish it. So in terms of, for, so for Martin, you've written about, and I'd like you to talk about, if, if he had lived, this, would, the, would the Poor People's Campaign have been different? Uh, would, where, do you see that, where do you see the trajectory of the, of the, the, the struggle? Where, where well, might... gosh, we missed his eloquence. We missed him, his ability to kind of bring us together, to tie together the complications of our, of the competing, compl the, the competition between competing interests, all of which, I mean, how he could tie together Vietnam and the Vietnam speech April 4 was terribly important because it was the same groups um, that were going to be affected. It was the same kind of values um, that we still need to challenge. Um, and I am... Um, and the warnings about excessive militarism and, um, um, I mean, the greed um, and materialism, boy, are they, is, 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 look at today. Um, so he really was a prophet who spoke the truth about who we are, and, and I, I, I cite often his, um, his concern that we were going to integrate into a burning house. Um, riddled by excessive militarism and materialism and greed, and that when somebody who heard him that night, because he was very depressed <laughs> at, the, at the end, I mean, because nobody, the country was going to hell, um, it, um, that um, when they asked him, you know, well, what should um, we be doing? And he said, we, 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 we all had to kind of become, <laughs> raise our voices, um, and, 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 and go to a different level of, of, of protest. And at the end, if you look at his speech at the National Cathedral, um, when he said, Why America May Go to Hell, um, that was his last Sunday sermon, his title that he sent his mama, when he had preached at the cathedral, the, you know, um, which was his last one before he went off to Memphis again about the Poor People's Campaign. And he kept warning America that, you know, the and using Lazarus, um, the rich man Lazarus and the poor man, I'm sorry, the poor man Lazarus and, and the rich man, that he didn't go to hell because, um, you know, he was rich. He went to hell because he refused to see his brother and to respond to his brother, um, and that America was at risk of going to hell and nothing could be righter. And look at how far towards hell we are in terms of where we're spending now on our military, um, when people are still hungry, that we've had some great progress in that area where people are still jobless, where children still don't have their basic housing needs met, where homeless is another. And I have no doubt that if he were here today and we'd made, um, we've made a lot of progress, but we still have progress to make, he'd be sitting here leading a poor people's campaign. But he was right, but he sort of told us that it was that we had a values crisis. And that, um, and I, at the end, a lot of his friends abandoned him because somehow we're not supposed to be caring about war. That's not our civil rights issue. And I looked at all the folk who spoke out against him and thought he had no right to speak out against the war when the folk who were dying in that war were disproportionately black folk and poor folk um, and Latino folk. Um, but the loneliness um, and the, 
and, when, and how, what it must have felt like when he was so abandoned by so many and told to stay in your place. Um, but um, I think that, um, you know, he laid a major foundation for all of us. And um, his speeches are as prescient today um, as they were then. We just have to, com we can figure out how to listen to him and follow him rather than just applaud him. Can you go back to the loneliness was great, which has some sound. He talked about, that just the, the way, a little bit of sound issue there. The loneliness, I mean, it, it, it's, it's tough. I mean, you know, the Poor People's Campaign was not popular, <laughs> okay. Um, his anti-war stance, none of your business. I mean, you're not supposed to talk on foreign policy, whether it's Ralph Bunch or other people, you know, all the folk. I mean, who needs to have a segregated conscience? Um, and it is, um, and to talk about excessive, you know, materialism and militarism and racism and that we all had to sort of become firemen and put out the fire in America's house. Boy, is that truer than ever today. We've made progress, but boy, when you look at who we are and the continuation of poverty and, you know, and letting your children be the poorest age group of poor people, and you look at gun violence and the violence that permeates everything that's here and it affects everybody, and who put the NRA in charge of our, our policies? My God, we had a, I mean, it, it, is, it, is, it is the need to, it, it's just, he is as relevant today um, as, and I, he's the first person I go back to read when I'm discouraged, um, and, and it's just, you keep going because America is self-destructing in the way in which we are the biggest arms dealer, the biggest arm purveyor. I mean, I mean, and look at who's killing everybody now. We're killing ourselves, and we can't seem to get control over this violence. And so he was absolutely prophetic um, in warning us about violence and about war and about the, the violence of poverty. Um, and we better hear him, and we better listen, because he was really speaking truth. Um, but he took a lot of criticism and a lot of alienation um, um, from being who he was, who was a, he was a true prophet. Um, and um, I'm just so grateful that our paths intersected, that I lived at a time of great social change and great social dislocation. But with great leaders, we still had mentors, the Dr. Mazes, who affected the Dr. Kings, um, who kept saying move forward and there's a different set of values here. Mm -hmm. And I hope that um, we don't jump off the, the deep dist end and can somehow begin to hear and listening, listen to him. And where do we go from here? We're gonna go toward community, we're gonna go toward chaos in a world sense or in, in a national sense and look at what we've got now. My goodness, um, how do you find some moral core here and that makes us different. Do you miss him as a man, as a person? Oh yes. Oh yes. The only I never liked about him was his, he never did a good, for, I'm a firm handshaker. <laughs> and then he, he always, I would think, had, I'd never called him a cold fish handshaker, but, he, but, but, but again, he was just a good human being, okay? And he was always accessible. I don't think there was ever a time when I needed to see him that I couldn't see him. Um, or where he, and, 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 that, and he didn't feel he had all the answers and so you could figure out it's okay for you to have to struggle and not to know everything um, and to trust God, okay, that you're not alone. And I still, you listen to that sermon in the middle of the night, the, the, the time when he the, this paid in his home, um, when he was sitting there saying, you know, we're, we're, but you could almost feel the presence of God saying, Mark, stand up. And so he, he, he's a man who um, lived his faith, sacrificed for his faith, um, had an uncommon eloquence, um, an uncommon patience, and I just hope I can be one-tenth as good and, and have the staying power that he had. Um, but he was a true prophet in our time, and to be able to have been part of that and to have learned from him um, and to have the privilege of carrying on in some small way what he began um, and to know that those people out in Resurrection City, I mean, you look at the nutrition safety net today, all those people on food stamps, but to thank him, all those people on WIC and on school lunches and school breakfasts, I mean, I, the, the, the change does not come in big chunks, but, this, the, 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 but the, within a year of the Poor People's Campaign, Mr. Nixon did a major speech on hunger, 
Um, we had a White House conference on hunger shortly thereafter. Um, the McGovern Committee got constituted with, with people who had gone to Mississippi in the Senate. It became a national issue. In fact, I was going back through some of the boxes, haven't had a chance to go through all of them, and just watch, the, to, to look at the number of um, Republicans who went out to Resurrection City. Um, John Sherman Cooper, where are they today? My goodness, and John Sherman Cooper, and wrote pieces and talked about, um, you know, how moving it all was. Um, and thinking about the, the, my favorite incident in the previous campaign was that you can't do it anymore. I lined people up along the Senate subway, um, and um, we were having a hearing. It was a terrific hearing. I um, didn't get any press because the Indians in the Supreme Court <laughs> were, and whatever. But I had a senator come up to me to congratulate me on my people's costumes. And I said, it's costumes? Um, but it laid the groundwork for what has become a series of laws. We were, you know, hunger was between the McGovern Committee and what, 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 what followed in the Congress. Um, we began to get major changes. Um, the Nixon administration, we had a follow-on campaign, which nobody would know about. We came back in 1969. And we met with, um, with no fanfare um, and with President Nixon and the whole cabinet in the White House. They didn't want us to go back agency by agency and they wanted to control it. And Monaghan um, was kind of the, the coordinator of all of that. You were, you were saying something that I did not know about, the, that you had brought these women, you brought uh, poor people to lie on the subway of the... If you could go back and sort of paint that picture so we understand. We didn't get any press for it, um, but when we were doing, there's a wonderful hearing and, and there are hearings. Um, where we, I went out to Resurrection City and picked out all kinds of witnesses to come up and tell, um, to speak before the Congress. And um, before the hearing, um, I had lined people up um, on the subways either side. You can't do that anymore. You can't get good theater. It's very much harder to get good theater. Um, and Ralph testified and a number of people testified, but the poor people's testimony was terrific. Nick Cotts catches a lot of that in his book. Um, it was a great hearing. We got no press, totally overshadowed by um, what went on in the Supreme Court with the Native Americans. Um, Roland Freeman has a wonderful photography book that captures a lot of the poor. But I just love this senator coming up to congratulate me on the costumes of my people. Um, your people have great costumes. Costumes, Senator? Uh, um, and it's very hard to find ways um, to, to do good theater today. Um, this one, I have a, one of our colleagues, my colleagues, um, um, who was on death row for four or five years, but on maximum security and maximum security in, in Tennessee for almost 25 years, something he didn't do. But he's, he'd used art as his way of surviving. And he's got us, we're, we're doing a 12 stations of the cross here. He's up at the Methodist building where we're gonna end up at the National Cathedral in a few weeks. But it's so hard to find in this jaded culture new ways of making people think about problems. Um, but I love that. You can't do any demonstrations anywhere in the Capitol anymore. Um, but that was perfect. What's your favorite memory and sort of surprising memory about Martin Luther King? Favorite or surprising? Let me just think about that. Those are two different things. Oh, favorite, just if you can riff with like something that makes you smile. The way he used to always say, well, <laughs> well. One of the things I couldn't stand about it, he had a, I always thought he had a bad, a cold handshake, you know, a cold fish. I wanted to sort of teach him how to shake hands, be more whatever. Um, but um, what is my favorite? It was, you know, he, he was always, I mean, I, I think that Seeing him as a 21-year-old, a 20-year-old, having gone against your college presidents, and we marched, and the Klan was there, and to have him be thoughtful, to come there, and, and all of our college presidents were sitting on the front row, but we didn't hear one on the pulpit welcoming their students that they had tried to keep them. But to see him come up just to be encouraging and to be there um, is probably one of my um, best memories of, of him. And I try to remember it when I'm impatient and don't want to take the time to see that kid or those ten kids. Um, and it was, and it was the listening at um, in, in Raleigh because he sat there in all the sessions, almost all the sessions during the three days we were there. And Ella Baker was wonderful, but she was saying, you know, she wanted us to have our separate. Don't become a part of SCLC. Uh, um, do your own thing. We flamed out in four years, but it was, a, but you need this continuum. 
And one of the things I think is so important and that we adults need to do a better job at um, is nurturing the seeds of leadership, of servant leadership. Um, you know, I'm more excited about our freedom schools than about getting a new law pass um, and to watch these children have role models and, and to teach them their history and let them understand who they are and not to let the culture change them, that they've got to change the culture. And until we confront these birth defects of slavery and Native American genocide and exclusion of women from the electoral process and the feeding of these white men taken, who were non profited and all they had was their skin and looking down on women and black folk. Um, but we've got to change the textbooks. We've got to change the narrative about our history. The other side understands this. They, who controls the narrative controls the future. Um, and I think Dr. King educated us in many ways. He didn't have silos. He didn't want to be put in silos. Um, and he knew how to laugh and have a good time, too. Um, and, but, and the accessibility and just the humanness. I mean, he didn't have any of the pomposity. Um, that we see too many leaders. I can't stand pompous leaders. Um, and but he 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 was he was just kind of there. And and I think that um, I'm not a patient person. And I'm you know and listening is a very important thing. But 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 he always came when you needed him. Um, and um, and I am. Um, I was so glad I was in Atlanta on on September 11th. Um, where we were, Luther Smith, who's wonderful, who's um, at Emory, Professor Emeritus now at Emory, but we were doing this Interfaith Children's Day, and there was this wonderful children's choir, and we were trying to bring children across all things together, and it was wonderful, and then Andy met me at the door to say, you won't believe what just happened. But you know, the first thing I want to do is go talk to him. I mean, to go across town and just to tell him what happened. Um, and to walk around Morehouse and to say, what would you do here? I mean, what, what would you say? Um, and in many ways, he is still my spiritual anchor. And the spiritual anchor, I hope, for many of us, because he really was our gifted prophet for this century. And we need to finish what he says. And we need to hear in the middle of this current national mess um, um, hear him talking about why America may go to hell. Um, and, um, and it's not because we're rich, it's because we don't see our poor brothers and, 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 and we violate the basic tenets of every great faith in the way we are conducting ourselves in our military arsenals and our disrespect for, for so many who are different. Um, and so he is still a prophet for our time. And I hope that we will hear him again that we'll pick up where we left them, the children are the key, um, and that if we can, um, and they know Dr. King and they are learning their history, we must make sure that that happens in schools um, and, and that we are going, despite this bad time, to remember who we are as, as folk, the suffering we've gone through, um, the things that we've overcome, um, and I watch our kids now learning they can change something, that I am strong inside, and I don't, you know, I know how to protest nonviolently. And so I think he's still a prophet for our time, and that we need to um, um, hear him, uh, and that we can ignore him at our peril. Um, and when I think about what he would be saying today, my goodness, <laughs> what would he be saying today? Um, um, and we have got to reject um, the charlatans and, 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 and the, 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 the false messengers and the false values that he warned us against and so the, the April 4th um, celebration at Riverside is very important. I hope we'll all reread that. I hope we'll all reread, you know, where do we go from here? You're, talk, you're talking about, like, his legacy today. What, what's misunderstood most? What's the, the biggest misconception? about the real Dr. King that you'd like to correct? The real misconception, you know, J. Edgar Hoover tried to destroy, you know, his character, whatever, but he was a man of deep faith and deep courage, um, who loved his country so much he was willing to die for it but to die for it nonviolently and at the hands of violence. 
Um, and if we can't, and you know, if, if what he talked about in terms of gun violence and the violence of war, and Bobby Kennedy, after he was assassinated, um, gave a great speech um, about violence. And we need to hear him. We need to hear him and not to deify him, um, not to, to uh, make him into something he wasn't, but his message was the message, as Abraham Joshua Heschel said, he was a prophet for our time. And so we don't need to praise him and build statutes to him, we need to follow him. Um, because he was not a perfect human being, didn't pretend to be a perfect human being, was always struggling, was scared like the rest of us, but he was a man of God who had a message. And I, if you listen to that speech in his home about um, midnight um, and not knowing where to go, but that we can all keep going and keep struggling even when we don't know what that next step is. But we are people of faith and we will trust God and we will keep trying to do God's work on earth and we will let it go at our peril. And so the chore between us, particularly now in this time, is to move us back toward community and toward decency and toward service and toward equality of opportunity and, and, and to make sure that every child has a level playing field. And so the, the, the point of honoring him is to, is to don't have a Martin Luther King Day, you go out and do the work and you make sure that every child um, has a chance to, to be who they are and to get a decent education and to be fed and you fight people who try to take away the basic safety net and you get out here, um, black folk and brown folk and everybody else, um, and don't just have a holiday, you, 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 you do the work of saving your children and saving the valleys of your nation. And so the only way you can honor him as far as I'm concerned is by carrying on what he started and boy are we faced with extraordinary stuff today. And so that the issue is what kind of movement will we do to end child poverty first and to end poverty in America. I've been, we've been referring to this period as sort of, you know, from 65 to the, to the end, as sort of Martin in the wilderness, as you talked about being besieged on, 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 on all sides. Um, can you talk a little bit about the, that him as a, as a man in this period after this, the limelight, like after the, the great successes of Selma and, and you, know, the, you know, he really had this, he wasn't as glamorous, it felt. And, and sort of along with that, I was thinking, when you're talking to him and you sort of, you weren't surprised by the assassination, um, did it change how you, every interaction with him, did you feel that it might be your last? No, well, that's a part of the job, okay? I mean, I'd lived, we'd lived through, we'd, 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 I mean, if you've been through Mississippi <laughs> um, and you'd been through the South, um, and, um, but that's a part of, 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 of what you might expect as a witness um, for justice. Um, that didn't make you not scared. Um, it just made it not paralyze you. Um, I was so moved when I took my children, grandchildren, but Medica's daughter was there and I asked her whom I love. And the stains, his blood stains are still on the, the driveway. Um, and my grandchildren are 11 and 12 and nine. And I didn't want to hear the lady who runs the, 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 the whoever the person is from the, you know, the, the service that covers these historical places. And I asked if, 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 if we could just have Rena tell us what it was like being an eight or nine year old um, and how they survived and, and um, what happened that night. Um, and it was really so profoundly moving. And when you think, and Medgar was the first person I ever met in Mississippi, picked me up. <laughs> I mean, you look at the time that people spent with young people. I mean, I was 21. I couldn't figure out what in the world I was doing up in law school, which I hated. With a, what in the world has this got to do um, with not with, with with the civil rights movement? And, and and I went down to figure it out because property and future interest wasn't doing it for me. Um, and Mecca picked me up, took me to his house to have dinner, drove me 95 miles up to. Greenwood to meet with my, my snake friends. Somebody had a shooting that day. The next day, the first day, the dogs came out. Um, and then they arrested everybody. But after the mob was there and they wouldn't let me up the front house court, courthouse, the three black lawyers were down 95 miles away um, in Jackson. 
um, and you sort of, I knew I could go to law school and, 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 and get through this. And I, you know, and, and change is painful, but I don't think it's as painful when I thought about it. every time I sort of think about my having a bad day, and Ms. Heyman always used to call me up at 12 o'clock at night and 1 o'clock at night long after I'd moved to Washington, or Ms. Maybertha Carter, when I look at the sacrifice and the courage of those people in rural Mississippi. So we have to hold that thought and the sirens room. When I think of Dr. King and his, despite the depression, <laughs> despite the spying, despite the chances to discredit him, despite the criticism and abandonment of his friends, hanging in there because he knew he had a more important mission um, that I think was a divine mission. Um, and I think of the people who changed this nation, who didn't have anything, weren't really well educated always, but that didn't mean they weren't really smart and wise. And when I used to get tired and Ms. Heyman used to call me, even if I move here, you got to go do this and you got to do that. And Ms. May Bertha Carter, and my last case in Mississippi um, was for the Carter family, the sharecropper family. Um, in Sunflower County, Mississippi, um, and they had 11 children, 10 children, 11 children, but they wanted their last nine children to get an education. And, um, and Sunflower County um, was a place I didn't, I tried to get out of before dark, and I sent it to East Lynch County. But they came to me right before I was about to move to Washington and say, I want you to file me a school desegregation case and my children go to that white school because I want them to get an education. And I said, now, Miss, 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 Miss Carter, y'all know what that means? And they said, well, we know what it means. And I did. And um, we won. But they lost it. They got pushed off their plantation. They got shot at. They didn't have any jobs, which is why that Head Start program next year was mighty and was, was, had become very important. Um, and they all, the last nine of those kids, went, finished high school. Um, and she taught them not to hate. Um, she would say, I'd pray that, that school bus out, and I'd pray that school bus in with my children, but she told them not to hate white folks. And they all became kind of professionals. Um, the, the ones who did end up going to college, they all did go to college. And about five, six, seven years ago, in a loose time, um, Connie Curry, who was a stalwart of our a white woman from Atlanta, who called me up to say, um, you got to help. Ms. Carter's grandson is in parchment prison. And I said, not Ms. May Bertha's, Ms. May Bertha's grandson in parchment prison, how could that possibly be? And that's how I learned about the Cradle of Prison Pipeline and about all these black boys and black men with an average educational level of sixth grade in that, and just filling up the jails in Mississippi. And that's our challenge today. Okay. I wanted to ask you about, uh, Bobby Kennedy, and did you, uh, did you know, I mean, when did you know that he had uh, authorized the, the wiretaps of... I knew it along with other citizens, and I didn't like Robert Kennedy because of that, okay? Um, in fact, I was, I didn't, and I don't know, when Peter came to Mississippi, I didn't want to have dinner with him because I thought I'd see a, 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 you know, an arrogant, you know, Pierce Salinger. Um, but the Robert Kennedy that I met was not the Robert Kennedy that it had done that was not the same Robert Kennedy because he had lost his brother and done whatever. Um, so it was, um, people change. But that doesn't mean you don't sort of hold them accountable for what they have done. Right. Can we talk about nonviolence uh, then? And uh, how is nonviolence misunderstood as a tactic? I don't know if it's misunderstood as opposed to, um, it's, it requires a lot of discipline. We, Jim, we have a council of elders um, who um, meet four times a year at Haley Farm with young people. And Jim Lawson, who is Dr. King's guru, is our chief guru, and we make sure that he speaks um, to all of our young leaders every year. And we've had all the civil rights leaders, which has been wonderful, because history, 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 whether from Andy to John Lewis to Dave Dennis, we show documentaries. Eyes and Prize and other documentaries, and then they step out of the documentary and they talk and say what it's like um, and the generosity of, of, of them. And talking about it, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's sacrificial. It is not easy. It requires courage. It requires incredible discipline. Um, but um, how else do you try to train um, a, um, a, a, 
a violent society, um, except by this example. Um, and I'm always just amazed at the courage and discipline of ordinary people of grace um, who wanted a better life for their children um, and to say, what in the world are we doing here today? And letting our children be in a cradle or prison pipeline and filling up the prisons, um, it's time for another movement. Um, and it ought to focus in on our children, it ought to focus on everybody else, but I think the children and prevention, but it is going to be um, our um, national undoing. Um, because um, you can't have a majority of all children in all racial groups and 75% of your Latina children and 80% of your black children who are the majority of your population now, child population, um, unable to read and compute at grade level. Who's going to be your army? I mean, who's going to be your future workers? I mean, how many drones and computers are you going to be able to have? Um, and so uh, our biggest national, military, and economic security challenge and threat does not come from any external enemy, even the North Koreans, <laughs> um, the Chinese. Well, you know, it's our failure to build a healthy group of children, educated group of children, um, who are going to be the leaders going forward. Um, and so I think that um, if Dr. King were here today, and if Robert Kennedy were here today, but Dr. King were here today, we'd be calling for a poor children's campaign, that 40th anniversary. We better pick up ourselves and finish that job. Because if we don't save our children, we're not going to be able to save ourselves. And I think that America ought to go to hell if we cannot take care of the weakest among us and not honor the legacy of our pretended, you know, equal playing field. Um, and um, honor the legacy of all those who struggled before. And if they could do what they did in doing slavery and doing lynchings and Jim Crows, we better get up to here and do what we got to do today. And so I hope that this 40th anniversary, 50th anniversary, um, I hope that this 50th anniversary is going to be a new call to action to end child poverty in America, and you can't end child poverty without helping families. And you got to talk about jobs and food. There should be no hungry children in the richest nation on earth. There should be no children scared to walk down their streets and not mowed down by gun violence. There should be no children who are not educated and who don't have a high quality early childhood education. The country is absolutely insane in wasting its future voices and leadership. And so I think that the urgency of 1968 is the urgency of now. And I hope that we will move toward community and we may not like these poor children who are black and brown and disabled and all the other, and we've come a long way, um, but we're gonna need them to work for us rather than to support them in dependent ways and to have them take away the soul of what we purport to say is what it means to be an American. So, um, and you know, I, so I think that the, the, the great movement is ahead of us, and, and in a world that is riddled um, with um, weapons, of which we are the main weapon person, um, nation, um, it is the time to talk nonviolence, and it's nonviolence or, or, or chaos and, and, and death for all of us. And so he is as prescient today and as relevant today and is issuing as much of a call to us today as he was calling to us in 1968. And I hope we will honor that call and hear that call and finish um, the next phase of his movement.